tonight on a special edition of American Investigator. On an Ivy League campus, black activists are not amused by the conservative newspaper's humor page, so they torch hundreds of copies. Reggie White says different races have different talents, and he loses millions in endorsements. And when the Boy Scouts of America refuse to appoint an openly homosexual scoutmaster, the courts find them guilty of discrimination. Has political correctness taken over America? And what does it have to do with this small school in 1920s Germany? It's a, you know, a recipe for a repression. The agenda of political correctness may not be a secret. Attack America. But it didn't begin in the 1960s. The work of these 1920 scholars has had dramatic effect. They are perhaps more alive than virtually anybody else. You'll be surprised to find that it may be the 1990s, but the Frankfurt School is still very much in session. Tonight, on American Investigator Special Edition. Good evening and welcome to a special edition of American Investigator, the only investigative news program that allows you, the viewer, to call in live. Joining me now is the Free F Congress Foundation's director of the Center for Cultural Conservatism, William Lind. Bill? Thanks, Paul, and good evening. For the first time, Americans today are not free to say what they think. If they say something deemed offensive or insensitive or, worst of all, hate speech, they may be in serious trouble. They may be punished for violating the unholy commandments of the 90s, commonly known as political correctness. But is political correctness a new phenomenon? We'll show you tonight that political correctness has been in the making for more than eight decades. Cornell University, located in upstate New York, is home to a number of student publications. But the conservative Cornell Review violated the commandments of political correctness with this parody of Ebonics in their April 1997 issue. For example, we parodied a course called Africana Studies 280, Racism in American Society. The white man be evil and he trying to keep the brother man down. We got Sharpton and Farrakhan, so who the man now, white boy? We be discussing racism in the U.S. It's sort of silly, but some of the black students on campus and black faculty got offended. They saw it as an attack on the Department of Africana Studies. And, of course, that department is sacrosanct, so one is not allowed to attack that. In retaliation for the offensive article, black activists marched to a nearby campus art museum where a student was receiving an award for excellence in interracial harmony and understanding from Cornell trustee Tom Jones, himself a former 60s radical. Once the ceremony started, about 250 students gathered all around this area and stormed up on the stage during the award ceremony, ripped the microphone out of Mr. Jones's hand and proceeded to present their demands. The administration took no action to stop the protesters. This is where the university president, in my view, should have stood up and said, wait a minute, and if you're going to protest, that's one thing, but you can't treat the admi university administration in this way. But he didn't do that. Rather, he sulked and said, okay, I'll give you whatever you want. The Cornell Review staff next saw their free speech rights literally go up in smoke. The protesters blocked off traffic at a busy campus intersection as they burned all copies of the review that they could find. While a few students reacted with moral outrage over the incident, most were afraid to speak out, feeling that objecting to the actions of minorities is taboo. Well, I think the average student, if they disagree with these tactics, are much more reluctant to speak out against them because the liberals are al always ready with their keywords of you're being intolerant or insensitive or going beyond that racist, sexist. And here goes Lenzel back here. They come! They come! But being black is no guarantee of protection against political correctness. As Green Bay Packers defensive end Reggie White well knows, in a speech before the Wisconsin legislature, White, an ordained minister, spoke of the sinfulness of homosexuality and of differences between the races. Hispanics were gifted in family structure. And you can see a, a Hispanic person and they could put 20, 30 people in one home. They were gifted in, in the family structure. When you look at the Asian, the Asian is very gifted in creation, creativity, and inventions. If you go to Japan or any Asian country, they can turn a television into a watch. They're very creative. 
Then you look at the Indians. They've been very gifted in the spirituality. When you put all of that together, guess what it makes? It forms a complete image of God. The reaction was swift and uniform. White was vilified by the media as ignorant, a bigot, and a fool. CBS Sports, which had been about to sign White to a multi-million dollar contract as a sports analyst, immediately withdrew their offer. White, however, stuck by his guns and refused to apologize or back down. Well, I, I was shocked more when not what I said about homosexuality, but more with the so-called stereotypes that I got accused of. Even time-honored private organizations like the Boy Scouts of America have fallen victim to political correctness in numerous court battles. In New Jersey, the ACLU recently brought a lawsuit against the Boy Scouts for refusing to appoint an openly homosexual scoutmaster. The courts ruled in favor of the ACLU, saying that the scouts were guilty of discrimination. But the matter is far from settled. I can't believe that a parent would want their son to go on overnight campouts, some as long as three weeks, with a person that they know is a homosexual. Lou Doty, who became an Eagle Scout in 1960, has been involved in scouting for over 40 years. Doty sees the assaults on privately run Boy Scouts and the million dollar court costs they've incurred as part of a larger agenda. The Boy Scouts of America is an institution and if the wrong people can tear down the right institutions, your society deteriorates. And it seems that a deteriorating society is exactly what political correctness strives for. But just what is political correctness? As you're about to see, political correctness is nothing less than a Marxist ideology. Marxism translated from economic into cultural terms in an effort going back not to the 1960s, but to World War I. <laughs> Marxist theory had predicted that if war came to Europe, the working class in every European country would rise in revolt. But that theory proved wrong. When the First World War began in 1914, the workers' loyalty to their country proved stronger than their so-called class consciousness. They willingly put on their uniforms, French or German, Austrian or Russian or British, and marched off by the millions to fight each other. In 1917, a Marxist revolution did occur in Russia, but it failed to spread to Western Europe, again contradicting orthodox Marxist theory. At the war's end, Marxist theorists had to confront the question, what had gone wrong? Antonio Gramsci in Italy and Georg Lukács in Hungary believed they had the answer. Gramsci and Lukács argued that Western culture had blinded the working class to its true Marxist class interests. Before a Marxist revolution could take place, Western culture had to be destroyed. In 1919, Lukács, who was considered the most brilliant Marxist theorist since Marx himself, asked, who will save us from Western civilization? That same year, 1919, Lukács became deputy commissar for culture in the Bolshevik Belakun government in Hungary, where he launched a program of cultural terrorism. As part of that program, Lukács introduced a radical sex education program into the Hungarian schools. Political correctness, as we know it, was already beginning to take form. He tried to actually undermine the unity of the family, and that was one of the reasons that he tried to introduce sex education. Laszlo Pastor, a leader in the Hungarian resistance against the communist takeover of Hungary after World War II, explains why children were targeted. It's always much tougher to convert an adult, you know, to do something what he was taught not to do. The program left great residual effects on Hungary. The only thing what we were permitted to accept as far as culture is concerned, what they were teaching, that was it. Free thinking was a very big sin. The Belakun government lasted only a few months, in part, because the Hungarian working class was outraged by Georg Lukács' assault on traditional Western culture. But meanwhile, in Germany, a new attempt to create a Marxist critique of Western culture was taking shape. There, the wealthy young son of a millionaire grain trader, Felix Weil, 
wanted to establish a public policy institute, a think tank, to serve as a home for advanced Marxist thought. Modeled on the Marx-Engels Institute in Moscow, Files Think Tank was originally to be named the Institute for Marxism. Martin J., chairman of the history department at Berkeley, an author of the history of the Frankfurt School, explains why the name was changed to the Institut für Sozialforschung, the Institute for Social Research. I think they were very interested in trying to avoid being overly labeled. Uh, so it's a fairly bland name, the Institute of Social Research.